brought up mm. uh, Tor before, and I think maybe just for the average person, I think for the average person by now, you know, probably if they're watching this, is probably aware of what Tor is. They might not know, understand completely how it works. You know, you know, yeah. it's this onion routing thing. Um, there's nodes. Um, but I liked. I did uh, watch the talk that you did, and I did like that you you kind of used Tor as the example, and then showed how Nim was the same and how it was mm. different. And I, and I I think maybe um, if you wouldn't mind, would could you could you speak on what the difference is between Tor and Nim? Just because I think that's probably going to be helpful uh, to a lot of people who already understand Tor. Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so the basic way that if you uh, use Tor, if you open a connection to Tor, uh, the Tor client in um, either in your Tor browser or now if you do it with, I don't know, something with like Brave or say you're using a crypto wallet and you can connect to Tor, right? What's actually connecting there is a Tor client. And <clears throat> your Tor client will essentially, it will um, look at all of the available nodes that it can use to route traffic through. And all of these nodes have uh, public keys up, right? They all have uh, these public keys are in a, in a directory. And so what you, uh, what you basically do with Tor is you then pick three of them, um, which is called a circuit with Tor. So you essentially say, okay, I want to talk to that website at the end. You pick a circuit of three Tor nodes in between you and that, whatever that endpoint is. And then all of the packets, the request that you want to send from your Tor client to that server or that endpoint, uh, you multiply encrypt it, which is where the onion and onion routing comes from, right? Because it's like an onion. So you kind of encrypt it backwards, right? So I want the server to be able to read the encrypted message. So I encrypt it with their public key. And then hop number three, which is where it's going to be coming from, I, I encrypt it again with theirs. And so you get this, essentially, yeah, this onion of encryption that then as I pass my packets to the first node in the circuit, they decrypt the outside, which they can decrypt. They know where to send it, but they can't see the contents, right? And the key thing, why, why bother doing this? Because it sounds like a lot of extra steps. Um, what you're essentially doing is you're uh, breaking linkability, essentially, between, you know, the, between the sender and the receiver. But you're also making it so no single node uh, knows both where the packets are going and where they're coming from. Right. And that's kind of the core, um, you know, the core idea of Tor that basically the, you know, your ingress node, that first hop, they may know where the packets are coming from, but they don't know where they're ending up. The exit node doesn't know where the packets have come from, but they know where they're going. And that's basically how, um, that's basically a very high level idea of how traffic moves through Tor. Now, this is susceptible to a lot of things that when Tor was designed were almost like science fiction, right? Which is stuff like timing attacks, where if you view the inputs and outputs of Tor, all of the traffic going in and out of Tor, and this has been done, um, you can essentially start like de-anonymizing, uh, start linking uh, the sender and the receiver. And you can also do stuff like traffic analysis because the packets moving through Tor are all different shapes and sizes. And as I kind of said before, you know, you can actually start inferring a lot of information about um, what might be inside those encrypted packets, even though you can't read them, right? So NIM works in a long, relatively similar principles, but with some like pretty key differences, um, which break the ability to do a lot of these kinds of attacks, right? So um, you have a NIM client, much like you have a Tor client, and instead of three hops, um, NIM traffic actually takes five hops. It goes uh, to a gateway. It goes through three mix nodes, which uh, do the mixing and mix net, as I'll get to in a moment. And then it goes to a kind of an exit gateway. And what basically happens is when you're going to send a request to NIM to a server, you uh, multiply encrypt. Uh, you know, you kind of have this layered encryption format, right? In the same way that you do with onion routing. But the, the main difference on the level of packets is that you actually break, you encrypt everything as identically sized packets. And they're encrypted in the Sphinx packet format, which is, you know, it's used by Lightning and um, a couple of other projects as well. You know, it's like just a nice, uh, uh, like a, 
they can fish in encryption format. Um, so they're all the same size. Okay, so as you see traffic moving through the mixnet, then you can't actually then start fingerprinting and going, oh, well, that may be, maybe that's an email, maybe that's a video file, right? So that's already kind of one vector of attack that you've that's kind of quite closed off. One of the other things is that instead of making a circuit, so instead of having kind of a route almost, you know, of these hops that all of your traffic goes through, NIM uh, routes by packet. So actually each packet will take a different route. So it's kind of there encrypted. I say you have your request, uh, you know, as a login request to your emails or something like this. So you have your, you know, you have your, you have your login request. It's chopped up into identically sized Sphinx packets. So they're multiply encrypted. So they're all the same size. They're all encrypted the same way. These packets are then numbered as well. Uh, sorry, they're numbered like on the first layer, which basically means the receiving party then gets all of these packets and they're all numbered so it knows how to reorder them and put them back together. They're all sent different paths through the mixnet. Um, and at each hop, right? So I mentioned the three mix nodes. Uh, so what a mix node basically does is it receives a packet, it decrypts the outside layer of it, and that all, all it's then left with is it's left with where to send that packet where next to send it in the in the you know in the kind of multiple hops that it's taking um and the you know the encrypted packet to actually send but what they do is they actually uh, there's a variable length time delay that's actually applied as well um so basically what that means is you could imagine a mix node is kind of if you imagine the packets as cards it's basically receiving all of these cards and then shuffling the deck before sending them out again so it's sending them out in a different order than it's receiving them which also means you, uh, your ability to then kind of follow packets via timing is, is kind of is broken then because you have all of these variable length delays. Now, you could get into kind of statistics and entropy with this. Um, one of the things we're working on is actually parameterizing our mixnet, so actually making it possible to have variable, variable length delays. So adding, basically like um, opening the envelope of randomness on this, which makes it statistically so much more difficult to start kind of trying to apply stuff to this. Um, but I can get into that a little bit later maybe. Um, and the final thing is um, a way of trying to combat, I think one of the biggest problems with privacy technologies, which is um, kind of your anonymity set at any one given point, right? Like the idea is, okay, cool. You have this kind of, uh, you have these packets that all look the same, traveling through a mixnet in a way that makes it very hard to track the path of an individual packet. But if there's only 10 people using it, then it's one of those 10 people, you know, like that. So, you know, we, we one of the things that comes up a lot in, them, in, our, in our blog posts and stuff, like a tagline that we use a lot is privacy loves company. And uh, so one of the things that we also have with the mixnet, which is where the Lupix name of the mixnet design kind of comes in is that all nodes and all clients are sending this fake cover traffic through the mixnet, right? And it's looping it through and back to themselves. And kind of when there's real traffic, that's being kind of almost, you can imagine it's being inserted into this kind of regular flow of identically sized, identically encrypted packets, right? So it's kind of, you know, loop, like hiding the signal in a noise. Um, and so then when you apply all of these things together, so identically sized packets, uh, variable timing delays in the hops, this kind of reshuffling of packets. And then you also have this cover traffic in, then you can start to see how the kinds of, you know, statistic, the kinds of like a statistic, statistic, oh, 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 statistical analysis of um, essentially network traffic that unfortunately, you know, governments, private companies, all of these people can, can now perform. Uh, you now see how that's like, a lot more difficult to start de-anonymizing people by linking stuff like the timing of packets, the size of packets, you know, all of this kind of stuff. You can start to see how that um, that de-anonymization is a lot harder to perform, basically. Another key difference from Tor, Tor has directory servers, which are basically the, I think it's 10, the servers that um, if you want to run a node, uh, or rather all the nodes that the network sees as up being up, exist on one of these directory servers, as soon as you, uh, your Tor client comes online, 
it will try and get what's called the, you know, the network topology, the, the possible routes and importantly, public keys, because you need those to be able to encrypt, um, to, so they can decrypt it, right? Um, it needs to be able to ping one of those 10. Now, obviously that's a certain point of centralization. Um, or, you know, at least a central, a certain centralization of possible attack vectors. So we instead are actually using a Cosm Wasm smart contract for this. So with the NIM, even though it's an overlay network, it's not attached to the blockchain at all. We do have a blockchain, uh, which is called Nix. And, um, you know, the topology is essentially kept in a smart contract, which means, you know, there's not necessarily a single point of failure there. If there are validators up, you will always be able to essentially ping the contract and get the topology. And the other key thing that I probably should have mentioned before as well, that differentiates NIM both from stuff like Tor and also other uh, mix nets as well is that it's incentivized, right? So, you know, this is, this is, uh, you're essentially doing like a public service by running a piece of privacy infrastructure, right? And I think even though, you know, Tor and I2P and LokiNet and all of these things have shown that people will do it from altruism for sure, um, there is a, there are certain positives that you can get from the incentivization of people running infrastructure that, um, you know, some of them are just people are spending time on this. People are wanting to provide essentially a public service of, I want to run, a, I, you know, I know how to do DevOps. I want to run a mix node and help provide privacy for people to use. Like that's just, I think, I, of course you should be funded for that because, that's just fucking sick. Um, but there's the other thing that you can actually do as well when you start having direct incentive, you, you know, you start having incentivization based on the quality of service that a node can actually operate. But then also you can, with stuff like tokens, you can also start building up um, like reputation schemes as well in the network, right? You know, we, you, you can, people can uh, delegate to mixed nodes, and um, there is a there is a closed set. There's a there is a set a number of mix nodes that will be mixing at any one point. And time in the mix net is split up into epochs, which at the moment are an hour. But there are more mix, mix nodes kind of waiting in the you know kind of waiting in the in the the sides of the stage to be selected to mix. Right. This is partially so. If there's a massive upsurge in traffic, that means we can scale the mix net. But also we can shrink the mix now if we need to, right? Which is important for privacy. Um, but what it also means is that like applying a kind of a, uh, a certain market, market dynamic is like a really loaded term, but it kind of within, within the kind of crypto economic incentives that we, I think that we've seen emerge in crypto over the last couple of years is how, how, you know, how you, how you should think of it. Having that then also allows it can defend the network against kind of a sudden uh, influx of, should we say, bad actors who want to try and run uh, dishonest nodes and um, start de-anonymizing packets, start de trying to you know, make links between their nodes. And this is because we have a reputation system. Um, selection and the reputation can be broken down basically into quality of service over time. So there are certain elements of the network that will always send packets through different routes and kind of check, okay, this, this mix node is actually, you know, uh, yep, I sent them 50,000 packets, I got 50,000 back, and I got them back really quickly and didn't drop any looking good or not. Um, but having a delegation scheme, which is basically where a node will say, okay, I, you know, maybe I'll 10% of my profits, I will then share between my delegators. This is, you know, maybe the kind of average you might earn. And, you know, we've also had mixed nodes who are like, uh, I'm going to donate X amount to this address, which is representing a, uh, you know, a charity for whatever, or a social group or an activist group and all of this kind of stuff. And those delegations also kind of play into the node selection weighting. This is important because then it makes it a lot more difficult for someone to just say, all right, cool. I'm going to buy 10 million NIM. I'm going to spin up a thousand mix nodes and I'm just going to get them in and I'm going to start de-anonymizing traffic. 
because they have no reputation from delegation from the community. Um, yes, so that's essentially our kind of uh, anti-dishonest actor takeover measure because, you know, with Tor, um, I was kind of talking about I was talking about the possibility of doing anonymizing people with regards to machine learning and kind of in terms of just like raw compute cycles. And you can also see it in this attack that happened to uh, on Tor. Accidentally, a researcher had access to a, a load of spare compute basically through a university, wanted to measure some stuff, and then at one point was running like a third of all Tor nodes, which obviously meant with a tiny bit of tinkering and a little bit of additional code, they could just start like de-anonymizing whole circuits. Um, you know, which is obviously a massive problem. So, um, yeah, I think that's about, that's the high level overview. <laughs> anyway, it's a, there's a lot of layers to the system, which we can dig into like different bits as well. But, uh, yeah, that's a, I'd say a rough overview and a comparison to maybe like more well-known overlay networks like Tor. Unchecked governments have eradicated privacy and truth. Those who resist are brought down swiftly, but we refuse to submit. Unipunks are freedom fighters, protected by encrypted shadows. The future we're building is sovereign and uncensorable. The moonlit night is coming.